Hey guys, Jerome here at 18 Minute Fitness Personal Training Studio. And today I want to talk about athletics and weight training. Should athletes try and lift weights explosively in the weight room? And should athletes try and mimic sport specific movement patterns inside the weight room? Now, the mainstream approach towards athletic training is yes to both of these questions. But the high intensity training, body by science that I, camp that I come out of means very hard. No, in that direction. And to me, it's not good enough to just take what somebody says by caprice or on faith. Um, I started putting this presentation together weeks ago. And as I was putting it together, Jay Vincent had NFL strength and conditioning coach Mark Asanovich on his podcast. And Mark not only brought up a number of excellent points, but also referenced a number of uh, researchers who have done scientific research in the field of motor learning and skill specificity. So what originally started as a relatively brief to somewhat moderate presentation on this topic started to balloon in this much bigger, all-encompassing and grossing task. I think I've read seven or eight books on motor learning and skill specificity in the last uh, four to five weeks, dozens of scientific articles and research papers that people have put out. Um, I've read as much information on this topic and its carryover into athletics as I could find. Um, so I wanted to give you guys the sort of culmination of that project and all of my efforts and time over the last month or so. I hope you enjoy this presentation today. Should athletes lift weights explosively? Let me preview this whole presentation for you guys. Why I decided to look into this, what I exactly I studied. I'm going to give you guys the too long didn't read version up front. I hate when YouTubers will save their opinion for the very end of the presentation. I'm going to give it to you up front and then explain my reasoning throughout the presentation. We're going to talk briefly about how motor learning works. I'm going to use the analogy of a roadmap to kind of put that, how skill specificity works into an understandable analog so that you guys uh, have something to keep in the back of your mind when you're listening to the information throughout this presentation. We'll talk about some rumors that happen with skill specificity, how training may or may not carry over to the athletic field. We'll dive into what the specific research actually says. And then I'll explain my reasoning as far as why I think athletes should lift slowly. And finally, we'll wrap it up with some hypothetical implications. We'll look at every scenario as if it's hypothetically true and see what logically follows from there. If athletes should lift slow, if athletes should mimic certain movement patterns in the gym, or if athletes should do it all quickly. We'll look at all of that. So why did I decide to look into this? Well, while I've always been a bit recalcitrant, and while my individualism is far from nascent, I think that the majority opinion uh, it can often be quite wrong. Mark Twain once wrote that whenever you see yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to reconsider your position. So within uh, strength training, bodybuilding, the general approach towards fitness is more is better. And I'd respectfully disagree with that. When it comes to weight loss, people are often told eat less, move more. I think that's a failed paradigm. The diet heart hypothesis that has existed in the 1950s, saying that saturated fat causes heart disease, I believe that hypothesis has been thoroughly refuted, but it's still the mainstream paradigm with a lot of doctors and cardiologists. Similarly, calories in, calories out. Bart K has done an excellent job uh, just murdering this idea. And I think it's time that we put it to rest. Politics and religion. I think there's a lot of things in both that I don't agree with, but obviously I'm not going to get into that. Those are all kind of broad, big picture things. Looking very specifically, very internally, um, I think it's dishonest to assert as fact what cannot be demonstrated to be fact. Like I said, I, I initially was leaning no quite strongly um, on these two questions. Should athletes lift explosively and should they mimic sport-specific patterns inside the weight room? I leaned very strongly no on both of those originally because that's what the body by science and by extension, the high-intensity training camp generally advocates. And given that I had agreed with Almost everything that those camps had said, um, I took what they said by faith with respect to skill specificity and motor learning. And um, I knew at some point I would have to dive into the research. And it's not good enough to just take what someone says at face value. I think that the intellectually honest thing to do is get as much information as you can and follow the evidence where it leads. 
And I'm trying to step back and look more objectively at that. Again, that's one of the biggest reasons for this presentation. I wanted to increase my knowledge and become a better trainer for myself and for my clients. And I think this is an ethical obligation for all personal trainers that they owe it to themselves and they owe it to their clients to constantly stay updated on the emerging body of research in their particular field and then adjust their training methodologies as necessary. I wanted to communicate my findings for people that have the same question. Um, granted, most people in athletic training answer these two main questions that I'm trying to address today in the affirmative, um, but I think there's a lot of people that kind of question that approach. I wanted to provide additional information for my clients and for other people. The videos that I put on my business YouTube channel, I put them there as a resource for my clients. So my clients that come here usually once a week you know, for about an 18 minute workout, um, I appreciate that they're willing to go through the workouts and for a lot of people pushing hard and seeing progress is good enough. But for those who are more curious about why I do every specific thing that I do here, I want to put out content that supports that so my clients have a better understanding. And finally, to satisfy my own intellectual curiosity, um, I'm constantly reading. Um, it's very calming to me. I, I love reading. Um, so I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. So what did I read? Um, I don't have it next to me. I apologize. It's on a desk right by my entrance door that I, I keep a lot of books on. Um, Motor Control and Learning, a Behavioral Emphasis, 5th Edition by Richard Schmidt. Um, now, that's an almost 600-page college textbook. I also read his book, Motor Learning and Performance, From Principles to Practice. It's another 300 pages. Uh, I read a number of Brent Rushall books and also some articles that he's put out. Now, I have a typo here. I apologize. It's actually Sprint's USRPT, Training for 50-Meter Races, came out in 2017. It was another 100 pages. Um, USRPT stands for Ultra Short Race Pace Training. Rushall worked with swimmers, and what he would do would basically be having swimmers, um, whatever distance they had to cover in competition, if it was 50 meters, if it was 400 meters, he would have them train at that particular distance at a speed that very closely approximated the speed that they wanted to try and have on the day of the actual competition. And they would perform as many intervals at that speed as they could. And if they failed to meet an interval, then they would rest for a few and then they would go back to conditioning at that exact pace. But Rushall's general approach to training swimmers was to get people to mostly only ever train um, in as close to competition settings as possible. There's a, a quote that I like with respect to this style of training that says to train something unspecific, then expect it to do something specific in a race doesn't make sense. I also read Rushall's book, Training the Hamstring Muscles in Intermittent Sprint Sports, came out in 2018. That was 96 pages. I was going to email um, Dr. Rushall and see if he wanted to do an interview, but unfortunately he passed away, I think right around 2020. And all of the studies that I mentioned later in this presentation, uh, a lot of them I read in their totality. Um, some of them were skimmed through quite heavily, but there wasn't one study that I referenced that I just read the conclusion. And in other videos I've done in the past, I've pointed out how sometimes just looking at the abstract or just looking at the conclusion, sometimes the researcher will come to different conclusions than what the data actually supports. Uh, this happened in a Brad Schoenfeld meta-analyses with respect to repetition speed. Um, there was a scientist in the 60s, I think, named Richard Berger that did research showing one set uh, for exercise is as effective as three sets, but he didn't change his recommendation of three sets because he didn't want to upset the exercise orthodoxy. And finally, a massive thank you to Mark Asanovich, Mike Bradley, Jay Vincent, Ron McKeefrey for the numerous videos, interviews, and presentations on sports training conditioning. I watched a, a number of these many, many hours um, during a lot of coaches' methodologies with how they train college and professional athletes and their underlying reasoning for such things. And I want to point out that um, these four names, I agree with a lot of what these guys have to say, but not everybody that I mention um, holds the same beliefs that I do. And I'm trying to step outside of my own biases. And I don't think we can ever completely escape our own. Um, 
but I'm trying to, to be as objective as possible. So what did I find? Well, let me, let me preface that by saying that my conclusions uh, right now are provisional and they're subject to change. If more information comes out, if anybody sends me um, some more definitive research than what I've found, it'll very likely make me lean in that direction. I am not above reproach. I am not above rebuke. But in my opinion, this is the too long didn't read. In my opinion, there is insufficient evidence to substantiate the narrative that athletes should lift weights quickly as to perform quickly during competition. And this also applies with training sports mimicking movements in the weight room. I don't think it has, I don't think there's enough evidence to support the idea that it has a positive transfer onto the athletic field. I believe that those positions have been reached by inference and by tradition. But similarly, now to take the uh, microscope to my own camp, I don't think there's any direct evidence to suggest lifting slowly will be of greater benefit to athletes. I think athletes should lift slowly, but I'll explain the reasoning why later. So let's look briefly at how motor learning actually works. In the bottom left-hand corner, that's a neuron. It's a nerve cell. And that skinny portion in the middle is called the axon. And the yellowish things that are wrapped around different parts of the axon are called myelin. Myelin is mostly fat, and it's something like 80% saturated fat. Now, neurons can be myelated or not myelinated, but myelin allows for a faster transmission of the action potential that's generated by that neuron. Interestingly enough, practicing a skill takes myelin. The more you do a very specific, a very precise skill, you get better at it. And one of the reasons that you get better at it is all of the nerves that start in the brain, that go through your spine, all the way down to the innervating muscles, um, those nerves become more myelinated or you do that skill. So you just get better at doing that skill. With that being said, let's kind of talk briefly about the map analogy. Now, if you're under the age of 25, you may have never seen one of these before, but this is a roadmap. It's essentially, it's a drawing of a certain area of land with all of the major roads and most of the cities along the way. And it's representative of um, all the roads in all the cities. So with the map analogy, let's say that driving from New York to LA is a very specific athletic skill following an exact route. It makes sense if you want to travel from New York to LA that as long as that drive is, you want to make that drive as efficient as possible and you want to get there as fast as you can. So imagine that your myelinated nerves are either the freeways, which are the roads that you can go the fastest on, or the fast lane on the freeway. So at least here in the States, if you're driving in the left lane, it tends to be you know, five to 10 miles an hour faster than the, more, than the lanes that are further over to the right. Now, keeping this map analogy in mind, think of any deviation from that specific skill as either getting out of the fast lane to a slower lane, or if it's further away, if you're doing something that's drastically different than that precise skill, um, or you're performing that skill in a, in a very different way, imagine like you're hopping off the freeway, you're taking an off-ramp, maybe going on the highways a bit. If you're doing something radically different, it might be equivalent to going through a small town and taking some back roads before you finally get back on the freeway. Um, and to the extent that you're altering the path, your drive is going to take longer and there's going to be less familiarity with that specific route. So some activities can have either a positive or a negative skill transfer, depending on how closely they resemble that exact skill that you're trying to do. I could understand how a football player bench pressing quickly might have some positive skill transfer. So in high school football, I was an offensive tackle, I was left tackle, and I was a right defensive end. And when you're a football player, I could understand how benching quickly and getting used to trying to recruit these muscles quickly and producing a massive amount of force quickly closely resembles the idea of getting into pass or run protection, getting your arms up quickly, exploding into that player that's directly across from you. Um, I could see the argument in terms of why an offensive lineman might want to do heavy bench presses relatively quickly. There's probably some positive skill transfer there. However, throwing weighted footballs probably has a negative skill transfer. In interviews he's done in the past, Mark Asanovich has talked about how when he was the strength and conditioning coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars in the early 2000s, 
a salesman came through in the off season and tried to sell them heavy footballs. And the idea was if you get used to throwing a heavy, a heavy football, you're going to strengthen all of the musculature that's involved in that precise throwing path. So that by the time the season starts and you get back to throwing regular size footballs, by increasing the strength of all the muscles involved, you can be able to throw a normal football faster or longer or harder. However, I will point out a study in a couple of slides that looked at something very similar but in a different sport, and we'll see what its implications were. Now, I want to note that this isn't binary. The degree of differentiation determines whether or not something probably has a positive or a negative skill transfer. And let me give an example. If you've never typed before and you're just learning how to type in school, at work, at some kind of workshop, um, the actual keyboard that you use probably doesn't matter much. And if you get relatively proficient at typing on that keyboard and then you go, you type on a keyboard that you've never typed on before or maybe someone else's laptop or someone else's computer, um, you might make some mistakes, but you'll have most of that motor learning in terms of how to type on vaguely any keyboard. That would be a positive skill transfer. But to look at an example very similar with a negative skill transfer, I have an MSI brand laptop that I keep here at work that I do most of my work on here. And it came out less than a year that, uh, different than an MSI laptop that I have at home. That I sometimes do work on. And if you were to look at the size of the keyboards, rest your fingers on the keys, um, but not do any typing, it looks and it feels exactly the same. But the amount of pressure that goes from typing on my work computer to my at home computer, um, if I try and do a lot of writing at home, I make a lot of typos initially, and it takes me a little bit of time before I can type comfortably without making a lot of mistakes that would represent a negative skill transfer. My ability to type on my computer at home is negatively affected by the subtle differences between my work and my home computer. Um, skills are extremely, extremely precise. And because they're so precise, and because someone's natural ability or experience with one thing or another, um, I think kind of dictates the degree of positive and negative skill transfer. I think that there's a lot of area that's open to interpretation by the athlete or by the coach or by the trainer as far as whether activities will or will not have a positive skill transfer. In general, uh, this is kind of a mainstream belief. Closed loop skills do not transfer much to open loop skills. Let me define what those are. A closed loop skill is something that happens in a controlled environment with a limited number of variables. Let's just go back to the bench press. If you're going to sit and do bench presses, there's not a wide variety of variables that goes into that. Just you, um, you know, maybe what you're wearing will have a really slight effect. You have a different spotter um, that can make a slight difference. But for the most part, everything with a bench press is pretty much always relatively constant. Looking back to a football player, an offensive lineman, that is um, definitely an open skill. You know, first of all, you have to know what the play is called, then you have to know what your assignment is. You get up to the line of scrimmage and you assess the defense and determine what individual are you responsible for blocking. The second the play is snapped, you immediately take action, but you might notice that the person you thought you had to block, maybe they're running a stunt or maybe they're blitzing somebody and your blocking assignment changes on the fly. Um, so taking a closed loop skill, like just bench pressing and producing a lot of explosive force in one direction, that would have a very, very, very small transfer to something like pass protection or run blocking. If you're an offensive lineman, because just this is a very small part of everything that goes into that skill of having to block a defender and open or closed kind of refers to a spectrum. There is no single task that is either completely closed or completely open. Think of it more along the lines of a spectrum. So skills are highly, highly specific. And one example that I can think of is when I was growing up, I was really good with a pack of cards. I started getting into magic and sleight of hand when I was a kid. And I had a pretty sensitive touch um, you can tell when you get a brand new pack of cards that you can tell how it feels brand new versus how it feels 
after just lightly manipulating it for 10 or 15 minutes versus how it feels at the end of application is maybe only 30 or 45 minutes long. Depending on the humidity, um, your refined sense of touch and your ability to manipulate a pack of cards will be different based on environmental conditions. If you washed your hands right before you performed, it can be a little bit harder to grab a precise number of cards. A good magician can, with a really, really highly refined sense of touch, can grab a certain number of cards. If, if a deck of cards is sitting on a table, they can reach from the sides and grab any precise number that you tell them instantly. And they can feel the difference in different card stock that is used in different playing cards. So um, the United States Playing Card Company makes a wide variety of brands of playing cards. And if you were to blindfold me or if you were to blindfold um, most magicians and hand them a standard deck of bicycle cards, the average magician will probably be able to tell that that's a deck of bicycle cards just by feel. If you give them a Tally Ho deck that's brand new, same kind of thing. They could probably tell what a Tally Ho, a tally ho deck feels like just by how it feels in their hands and, and how it feels when they start manipulating it and shuffling it around. Um, same with B playing cards. Bs tend to be a little bit thicker. I think it's on a heavier card stock. It has a different ink pattern on the back that makes the backs a little bit more rough. Um, these are extremely subtle things that most people will never pick up on, but it's something that is really, really important for somebody who handles playing cards for a living because you have to develop your skill specificity that precise to do some of the movements that you have to do. And if you hand a magician, a if he only ever practices with bicycle playing cards, and then you hand him a B deck, it's going to be more work for him to do a lot of very precise moves because the sense of touch is very, very different between those cards. But most lay people probably couldn't feel the difference at all. So getting in, sorry about the, the tangent here, but to get in a little bit of the science, uh, Montoya found that swinging a heavier bat's or a bat with one of those donut weights that batters put on actually reduced normal bat velocity. And this has been known since the 60s when this study came out. You still see this today where somebody is uh, actually up to the plate and then the batter that's on deck is swinging either three bats at a time or he's putting a weight on the bat and he's swinging it. Um, so what they did is they tested you know, average bat velocity after swinging heavier bats, lighter bats, and normal bats. And um, they also referenced a study in Montoya where they showed college baseball players who swung lighter bats right before swinging normal bats also had a reduced bat velocity by the time that they had to actually skill. So this would represent a negative skill transfer. Basically, in short, if you want to get good at swinging a baseball bat and you want to have the fastest bat speed possible, you need to practice swinging a normal bat. Swinging a heavier bat or bat with a weight on it, or swinging a lighter bat will not translate to swinging a normal baseball bat. Despite the fact that these skills are almost exact, you know, basically one variable between them. So Mount and others found that altering body position drastically affects one ability to throw darts. This was an interesting study. They had a couple of uh, groups of individuals that they tested, and they had a control group. But one group basically sat perfectly upright in what's called a balance chair. It's B-A-L-A-N-S, and it's a chair that you kind of kneel in, and it keeps your torso perfectly upright. And people had to throw darts at a target. And then they tested a position where people were leaning backwards 45 degrees, and they made sure that the height of the bullseye was adequately adjusted, and they had to throw darts. And they found that practicing in one position made them significantly worse at throwing darts from the other position. And groups that didn't practice at all, excuse me, performed better uh, in each position than the group that practiced one way and then threw darts the other way. So this also is an example of a negative skill transfer. And there's the reference. Where it gets confusing is there are a lot of conflicting opinions and there are a lot of conflicting research studies with respect to positive and negative skill transfer. So when treating hemiplegia, which is paralysis on one side of the body, Voss, Ayana, and Myers in 85 pointed out that diagonal limb patterns are beneficial because how they mimic regular life. But they noted that therapists who work with people with hemiplegia often work with a patient lying supine or lying on their back. 
Arn Shepard in 87 questioned how much carryover there was going to be from working with patients when they were laying down to where they're sitting upright because there's no postural involvement. They're not engaging their trunk to try and maintain that degree of stability. Bobath in 90, uh, Sawyer and Levine in 92 recommended practicing leg movements, both laying down and sitting up to prepare a client for walking. Bobath in 82 recommended treating clients in functional, pa- uh, functional positions. And as far as I could find, the idea of skill specificity goes back to Henry in 1958, who introduced this idea. But even his research showed um, there was little skill transfer or, in a lot of cases, no skill transfer between similar activities. And let me show you. Uh, Lindeberg and Hewitt in 56, Laurel and Archer in 58, Puritz in 83 all showed positive skill transfer between very similar motor skills. However, Cormier in 87, Fisherman and Learn in 91, Lewis McAllister and Adams in 51 all showed negative skill transfer between similar motor issues. So some people say there is positive carryover. People say there's not positive carryover. Schmidt, same guy that wrote uh, the two books that I read, showed positive and negative skill transfer in similar skills. So which is it? If you're performing similar skills, is there a positive transfer? Is there a negative transfer? Or, or is there some degree of both? Well, here are all the references if you want to read the studies yourself. Now, because a lot of these studied or studies cover things like balance and works with athletes and sports specific movements, um, I wasn't originally planning on addressing balance, but because it was mentioned so much in the literature, I thought it'd be worth touching on briefly. So there's this idea that if you train on an unstable surface, it will promote strength in the muscles of your trunk, which is more conventionally called the core, but that terminology is, is incorrect, and you'll improve balance. Uh, it's true in the sense that your trunk muscles will flex with up to 30% maximal volitional contractile force during limb movement. So if you're moving your arms and your legs, muscles of your trunk have to flex to maintain stability and posturing. but Sorry, here are the four references for that. My question is, is 30% of the maximum amount of force that you're capable of volitionally contracting, is that enough to improve the functional strength of those muscles? Yeah, I don't know. That actually, that sounds relatively weak. Um, I'll give the source for the next two quotes in a bit, but the correlations between performances on different balance tasks were extremely low on significance. And uh, the same study also found that there's no general phenomena called balance. They found that you can be really good at conditioning balancing in some ways, um, but that doesn't carry over to balancing in other ways. That's from Jawaski and Zuccato, Interrelationships Between Selective Measures of Static and Dynamic Balance. Uh, Training on unstable surfaces reduces safety and also reduces force production. So you see this a lot in athletics where... And you see this a lot with personal trainers, too, that are working with a variety of populations, and they say that people need to do these movements on bozu balls or uneven surfaces or balancing on one foot so that they can work their stabilizer muscles um, and improve their balance. Well, first of all, there's, there's no such thing as a stabilizer muscle. Stabilization is a task that a muscle can perform. A muscle's purpose is to produce force. And that force can be used to either permit movement or to prohibit movement. Um, But there is no stabilizer muscle. So if you're doing a bicep curl, and I'll get to this example in a bit because I talk about bicep curls, muscles of your hamstrings, your glutes, your lumbar extensors, and some of the muscles in the back will contract with a relatively light degree of effort to maintain torso stability as you're curling your biceps. If they didn't, you would fall forward because the weight in front of you alters your center of gravity and you have to take action in spite of that to stand upright so you can perform this exercise. Does that mean that your glutes, your hamstrings, and your lumbar extensors are stabilizer muscles? No, it's a role that they are performing in that moment by generating a small amount of force to counterbalance the weight that's being held in the moment arm. So when you see personal trainers, when you see athletic trainers, having their athletes train on these things to improve balance. If you're doing an exercise balancing on one foot on a bozu ball, that's only going to improve your balance on that one precise skill. Again, Drowatsky and Zuccato found that there is no general phenomena called balance. Let's address some other myths. You need to train fast for fast twitch fibers. Well, fast or slow twitch refers to how quickly they fatigue, not how they're recruited. 
And interestingly enough, the force output is actually similar between uh, fiber types. Now, the caveat to that is you have to have muscle fibers of different types that are basically the same size. So a slow twitch muscle fiber that's the same size as a fast twitch muscle fiber, both produce about the same amount of force. What's the difference in contraction speed between fast twitch and slow twitch? 60 milliseconds. That's 60 millionths second. So I need to also preface this point a little bit. Um, I, here I talk about the NSCA position on explosive training, but then the next sub point is looking at the American College of Sports Medicine. And I know what you're going to say, Jerome, those are two different certifying bodies. Um, why are you bringing up one and then critiquing the other? Fair point. Um, but I couldn't find the actual research that the NSCA references um, to substantiate their position. I have the book that the ISSA uses uh, to get or for their personal trainer certificate. Uh, it's over a thousand pages. You can read the references in that. Um, I have the research that the American, American College of Sports Medicine references. But the reason I mentioned the NSCA position here is I tend to believe that the NSCA, the ISSSA, the ACSM, the American College of Exercise, um, all of these certifying bodies, almost all of them aren't actually doing any direct research themselves. They are looking at the research and they're basing their conclusions allegedly on that research. So I don't want it to seem like I'm attacking one. I, I tend to think they're all very similar in looking at the research and coming to their conclusions. So the NSCA position on explosive training is they are for it because they believe that explosive training simulates movement patterns and velocity and acceleration patterns of many sports movements. Now, in a meta-analysis done by Otto and Carpinelli, looking at the American College of Sports Medicine and their position on uh, different training modalities, they found that out of 20 studies cited by the American College of Sports Medicine on explosive training for power, only four of the referenced studies support the claim. But three out of the four that support it have serious methodological flaws. 14 of the studies that are being referenced to support that position do not support that position, and two of the studies referenced directly repudiate it. So out of 20 studies that the American College of Sports Medicine uses to validate their position that they believe athletes should train explosively, um, only one actually directly supports that position. And the vast majority, 16 out of 20, do not support that position. That comes from Otto and Carpinelli's 2004 meta-analyses, uh, I believe a critical analysis of the position stand of the American College of Sports Medicine, page 41. We also hear that you have to train muscles, sorry, you have to train fast so your muscles contract fast. Well, as far as I can tell, there's only four factors that actually determine how fast a muscle contracts. How much myosin ATPase is in the muscle cell, the structure of the tubules, which is the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum structure, troponin's sensitivity to calcium, and troponin, uh, I believe, is a protein that kind of acts as like a gateway, it kind of opens the door for calcium to get into the cell um, so that the muscles can contract. I, I could be wrong in that. And finally, the diameter of the innervating nerve. Uh, with that, think about how big the electrical cable is if you have an electric range or for your refrigerator at home versus the diameter of the cable for my optical ones here. Now, an interesting point, those are all genetically mediated traits. And that comes from a Dr. Lamb at Ohio State University who wrote Physiology of Exercise, Responses, and Adaptations. Let's keep looking at that. You have to train fast so muscles contract fast. Well, Sale and McDougall found that the number one thing that makes an athlete explosive is what's going on in his head. Remember earlier I talked about as an offensive lineman, I need to know my play. I need to read defense. The second the ball is snapped, they need to react very quickly, but this can change in a second depending on what the defense is doing. My blocking assignment might change. Um, there's a number of variables that all go into play that determine how explosive I'm going to be on that play. And a lot of that's in my head. Bobbert found that improvement in technique is the major determinant of power development. There's this idea that training slow produces slow athletes. Well, power is a combination of skill and strength. So I'm strong. I'm much stronger than most people my age. My best ever bench press, I've never done a heavy single, but 
My best ever bench was 275 on the incline for three reps. Uh, my best squat, uh, low bar squats, 405 for sets of six. And I did do a 550 deadlift single. Um, so I'm relatively strong, but I suck at swinging a golf club. Professional golfers who are my height have much faster uh, head velocity on their golf clubs when they're swinging a golf club than I am because it's a highly coordinated movement despite me having maybe or 40 or 50 extra pounds of muscle on my frame that they don't have. Similarly, boxers will throw stronger punches than bodybuilders. Fisher and others in their uh, 2011 meta-analyses said that explosive movements are also not recommended as they present a high injury risk and no greater benefit than slow controlled weight training. This was a meta-analysis of 128 studies. And to be fair, not all 128 looked at repetition speed or skill transfer between different abilities. Uh, Fisher's meta-analysis looked at a wide variety of factors, strength, hypertrophy, skill transfer, balance. Um, So don't think that there's 128 studies that explicitly substantiate this one position. Let me sum up my position a bit before I go into more details about why I believe what I believe. I believe that slow lifting, lifting concentrically very slow and lowering slowly, is as effective as lifting quickly for hypertrophy. This comes from Brad Schoenfeld's meta-analysis of repetition speed. Brad looked at eight different studies that met his criteria and determined that as long as you are training to failure, it doesn't matter if your repetition speed is half a second or six seconds. As long as you train to failure, um, they are equally as effective for muscle size, which is hypertrophy. Slow lifting is as effective as quick lifting for power and endurance. Otto Carpinelli and Weint, 2004, critical analyses of ACSM position standard resistance training. Um, There's the full reference for that. I mentioned that study earlier. Strength, James Fisher, James Steele. There's the reference and balance. Their study said that there's a lack of evidence to suggest that balance from free weights or the use of unstable surfaces shows any transference sporting improvement. Lifting slow is also far safer. And I believe that athletes in almost every instance should lift slowly to build strength and let their sport-specific conditioning handle the improvements of those specific motor learning pathways. So again, my position is slow lifting is every bit as effective for muscular size, power and endurance, strength, and balance. And I'll discuss a couple exceptions because I already willing to concede that, you know, there may be some instances where like an offensive lineman in American football might make sense to bench press very quickly. And I'll discuss reasons why people should lift that way. But in general, I think athletes should lift slowly. Lifting explosively makes you far more susceptible to injury. The number one cause of injury in the gym is poor form. The faster you lift, the less control you have over the weight. You also experience significantly higher shear forces. What's a shear force? Shearing force is essentially force being applied in multiple directions on one object. Now, the reason lifting quickly has higher degrees of shear forces comes down to the formula for force. Force is mass times acceleration. Acceleration is change in velocity over time. Velocity is distance divided by time. Therefore, force is mass times distance over time squared. So whether you're going to lift a weight quickly or slowly, the mass, the amount of weight that you're going to lift, and the distance are essentially the same. But if your cadence, the speed at which you lift it, is four times slower, it's going to be one sixteenth the force on your joints. Um, again, that time interval is in the denominator and it's squared. So the mass and distance are going to be the same, but you square the time unit and you're going to produce significantly less force joints. I think I have, yep, there it is, second green arrow. The red arrows loosely represent the direction that the bicep is contracting. Now those muscle fibers are going to pull on the tendons and the tendons are going to pull on the bones, right? That's how the move. So the red arrows represent the direction that the muscle fibers are contracting and the direction that they're pulling on those tendons. I guess this way is more appropriate. But because of Newton's third law of motion for every action, there's an opposite reaction. You also have shearing forces in the opposite direction. But that's not the only shearing force that's at play. Earlier, I mentioned that 
the muscles of your glutes, your hamstrings, your lumbar extensors, some of the muscles at the back have to contract so that you can stand upright while curling a weight. Because if you just hold a heavy weight in front of you, that's going to alter your center of gravity. So you have to contract to maintain proper posturing. Because you're contracting, to counterbalance this weight, you also have some shearing forces on the upper bicep tendons pulling backwards. Athletes should lift slowly because lifting explosively makes you more susceptible. Again, for the most part, I'm not overly concerned about people getting hurt in the gym, but I am worried about cumulative subacute injuries or micro trauma. Um, there's basically three types of injuries. There's chronic injuries, which are things that you will feel or experience for a lifetime. There's acute injuries, things maybe like um, you know, a sprain that affect you for a relatively short amount of time, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe a few months. And then there's subacute injuries. And these are the ones that I'm really cautious about. And I guess I'll, I'll give my explanation for it. The idea is that people can lift for years without issues, or they can perform in sports for years without issues, and then suddenly they can just snap a tendon or pull a hamstring um, or have some you know, performance-related injury just seemingly right out of the blue. Well, what, what happens here? I think what happens is every time you go into the gym, every time you perform an athletic movement, so long as there's movement at all, there is some degree of shearing forces on your joints. And because tendons receive significantly less blood flow than the muscles do, they often take much longer to heal. So we think from a very muscle-centric point of view oftentimes when we're lifting weights because we're so focused on getting bigger muscles that we should probably be more attentive to the effect that that's going to have on our joints. If Think about it this way. Every time you lift weights, there are shearing forces. Because there's shearing forces, there's likely some slight degree of damage. Ideally, we're giving our bodies enough time and we're not doing so much volume that we allow our body enough time to fully repair um, the damage done from that exercise or from that workout before we do that movement path again. Um, so if you dig a really small hole into a road and then we fill it up, ideally we, we put a little bit back on top of that. This is kind of the inroad analogy that's used with building muscle. When you work a muscle really hard, it's like digging a hole into a road and then we fill that hole back up and then we hopefully build a little bit on top of that. But something similar kind of happens with our joints. Imagine we produce a, a certain amount of shearing forces on our joints that creates micro trauma. We dig a little bit of hole into that. But if we go back to doing that same movement before we're fully recovered, we don't fully or we don't fully fill in that hole before we take another chunk out of it. And at some point, this is going to reach a point where that road is not drivable because the depth of the hole is too big. It becomes dangerous. That's how we get potholes, essentially. And I think a lot of times that's what happens to our joints. If we're doing too much volume, if we're doing too much frequency, if we're lifting very ballistically, we may not feel that micro trauma in that moment. Um, we might not feel it until months or years down the road when we're suddenly doing an activity and, and then all of a sudden we snap a tendon. And I tend to think most of those injuries are from cumulative micro trauma to the joints, not necessarily anything that we did wrong in that particular movement. If you look at tensile strength in rope, and I was a firefighter for two years, and when I was a firefighter, I was also on my county's uh, elevated rescue team. So if we had to rappel down a cliff, if a hunter got stuck in like a deer stand and maybe had a stroke and had to be rescued and taken out of it, anytime we had to put a harness on somebody or something and rappel them up or down something, um, I, I learned a lot about the basics of kind of climbing. So the tensile strength of rope is extremely high. And the tensile strength is the amount of force that a rope will take if you pull it in opposite directions. How much force can that rope take before it snaps? And I included this picture in the bottom left-hand corner for that reason. Imagine that your tendons are that rope. And you see that you have a little bit of edge protection here. The reason you have that edge protection is it prevents a lot of rubbing back and forth of that rope on a hard surface. If you have enough load that you're working with, or if you move at a high velocity, or if you're just moving constantly back and forth, eventually that rope will fray. 
And when the rope becomes compromised, the amount of tensile strength that it has is drastically reduced. Well, interestingly enough, the working load limit on rope is often one-tenth or one-fifteenth of the tensile strength of the rope. So while your joints and tendons may be relatively strong, if, again, if you're working out too fast, too heavy, uh, too frequently, or with too much volume, and you're not giving your body ne what it needs in terms of recovery, you are gradually wearing away at this rope to where it may not seem like a big deal at first, but once that tensile strength is compromised past a certain point, it's not very easy. So REI, who sells a lot of climbing gear, recommends that you replace rope if there's any signs of damage, flat spots, stiff spots, fuzziness, fraying after any heavy falls, or if you're training often enough, you know, if you're climbing almost every single week, you should replace your rope once a year just as kind of a safety measure. And the reason why that tensile strength is so important and the reason why the working load limit is one tenth or one fifteenth is if you're climbing and you have a sudden fall, your safety line will catch you. But it's not so much your body weight that causes the issue. It's your body weight times the acceleration. And people fall at 32 feet per second. So um, the amount of force that is applied to that rope in that moment if you fall becomes uh, extremely, extremely hard on that uh, safety line or on that lifeline. But that also closely resembles if you're lifting near maximal weights very explosively. That is a lot of force on those tendons. Now, fortunately, you can buy new rope as soon as you have the money, but you can't really replace your tendons. So I would rather err on the side of caution than, um, then recommend athletes lift ballistically or try and do some of these movements, knowing that I could be causing unnecessary subacute trauma to their joints. Why else should athletes lift slow? Well, lifting slow produces more torque and therefore engages more fibers. A loose definition of torque is the force applied by muscles through a moment arm. So in short, the faster that the load is moving, the less recruitment you need, the less torque you have. Um, as you carry it through the rest of the range of movement because of momentum. So if you are going to do a bicep curl um, extremely quickly, trying to explode a bicep curl up, you're generating a tremendous amount of force initially, force is mass times acceleration. And that force, the muscles pull on the tendons, tendons pull on the bones. Those are really high peak forces that are being experienced by your joints. But once you've created that massive amount of initial force, the weight now has momentum. And because it has momentum, that momentum will carry it through most of the rest of the range of movement, and you'll need very, very little force to continue to lift it. So with velocity plotted on the y-axis, the faster you're moving that weight, if you're lifting that weight, and you can see my mouse explosively as fast as you can, you need very little force, very little x-axis involvement to continue to lift that weight. So you generate a lot of force on your joints initially, and then you're drastically reducing the amount of torque that your muscles are producing while you try and continue to lift that weight. Um, if you don't need to produce a lot of force, again, muscle fibers are recruited by need. That means you are recruiting very little muscle fiber through most of the range of movements because this weight now has momentum. And again, because of the time element, force is mass times acceleration, because that time element is squared, this isn't linear, this is logarithmic. Also put together this gradient to try and explain why some lifting modalities are more dangerous than others. Now, there's a wide variety of risk factors with respect to exercise. There's the amount of load that's being used, there's the velocity that you're lifting, there's volume, there's frequency, there is uh, form. But unfortunately, I can't create a six-dimensional graph, uh, so I just did this for load and velocity to kind of point out why some activities are more dangerous than others. So Davies in the British Journal of Sports Medicine back in 1980 found that weightlifting accounts proportionally, it's being uh, the keyword, more injuries than any other sport. And if you just Google which sports produce the most injuries, um, you'll probably find different results than what I'm going to say, but because it doesn't take into account the per capita of the number of individuals that engage in these particular activities. So in 1980, weightlifting basically meant Olympic lifting. Number two was powerlifting. And number three was American football. So you can understand my apprehension when I see American football players doing powerlifting and Olympic lifts. When just looking at these two variables, load and velocity, 
if powerlifting is dangerous because you have essentially as much weight as possible and you're moving at a somewhat moderate velocity, I'm not convinced you can maximally lift a weight super quickly. Olympic lifting is dangerous because you have to lift very quickly to perform some of these movements, excuse me, and you're using near maximal weights. The AMRAP method and CrossFit in general, you're lifting very quickly. You're doing as many reps as possible or you're performing these very fast clean and jerks, snatches, overhead presses, hipping pull-ups. You're doing these movements very, very quickly with a relatively high degree of weight. Super slow, high intensity training, however, is way over here. You're using in general, depending on your time under load, 60 to 66% of your one repetition max. So relatively light load. Um, and you're moving very, very slowly. It's much safer, at least when looking at load and velocity. Are there times that athletes should lift quickly? Yes, absolutely. If you're training specifically for a weightlifting competition, if you're a power lifter or if you're an Olympic lifter, you have to do these precise movements and you need to do them in conditions that very closely approximate what you're going to be experiencing on the day of the competition. If you are a strongman or do anything like the Highland Games, you are going to have to practice those specific activities. The only way to get better or the best way to get better is probably what I should say about throwing the caber if you're in the Highland Games is to throw a caber. Now you can improve the strength of other muscle groups that will make you throw a caber better in a sense because your muscles will be stronger. But the best way to get better at it is to perform that precise task. And it makes me think of Jay Vincent, who I believe has two training videos with Elliot Hulse. Um, Elliot was training for strongman, um, but Jay recommended uh, doing high intensity training in the off season and then basically dropping the high intensity training once strongman season started picking up and then start working almost exclusively with the Atlas Stones um, and with all of the other you know, heavy farmer carries and stuff like that, that Elliot would have to do strongman competition. So strength-based athletes, Olympic lifters, power lifters, strongman, Highland Games, any other basically strength-related sport, or not strength-related, but strength-heavily dependent sport, will probably have to do some kind of mix of strength training plus working on their sport-specific skills. And I think some athletes should probably periodize strength training and then work in specific movements as the season approaches or commences. Um, CrossFit. In a recent conversation I had with a doctor of physical therapy, uh, Dr. Matt Pachukniak, um, he told me that most CrossFit athletes don't train CrossFit year-round anymore. They tend to do general strength training most of the year, and then as competitions start creeping up, as it starts getting more into their competitive season, then they'll start working the kipping pull-ups back in. Then they'll start working in the rope climbs and the jogging distances and some of these other things that they actually have to do during their competition, but they don't train your CrossFit year round because they start recognizing that um, unless they're maintaining perfect form, some of these training modalities were having a negative effect on their joint health. So it makes me wonder why the hell are non-athletes, you know, training CrossFit year round when even the people that do this at a very high level don't train this way most of the year. Endurance athletes, if you are a cyclist or a marathon runner or do any kind of like Ironman endurance sport, if you can tolerate it, and that's a big if, I think you should probably strength train to try and, try and preserve the fat-free mass that you have. But I think that's very unlikely with endurance athletes during their actual competitive season. Uh, Brent Rushall, who I read two of his books and a bunch of his articles earlier, or I mentioned him earlier, didn't think swimmers should strength train at all. You need to be careful during the season. Depending on the nature of the sport, you need to really carefully program your strength training. Steve Maxwell, who was the first American to receive a black belt in Gracie Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and the first American to open a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym on the East Coast, has his MMA and BJJ athletes train one to two times a week. And Maxwell has trained Ronda Rousey. He's also trained Grace Gracie. But he's noted that for his MMA athletes, that oftentimes strength training two times a week constitutes overtraining because of how much other MMA and BJJ work they have to do every single week. Mark Asanovich, a 20-year NFL strength and conditioning coach, had his guys strength train one time a week. He would have them do their strength training routine, have them do one set to failure, basically, and that would happen on Mondays because their games were on Sundays. 
Mike Bradley, a NCAA coach at Florida State University, has his starting athletes train once a week, strength train once a week. His backups train maybe twice a week, and his practice squad guys who have a lot less direct um, actual sports performance during the season train three times a week because they're trying to build their strength to hopefully make uh, higher rounds. All of these guys limit the frequency of their athletes because of the intensity and exhaustive effects of high-level sports. The body has a limited capacity to recover from physical stress. In Body by Science, co-author John Little gives a case study of a semi-professional hockey player who lost lean body mass as the season went on. And Little and Doug McGough and this hockey player have noted that this is relatively common in a lot of professional sports. A lot of times guys will show up um, to training camp or will finish training camp and get ready for the preseason and be in really good shape and have you know, maybe 15, 20 pounds of muscle that they didn't have at the end of the last season. And then they'll get smaller and a little bit weaker as the season carries on. Oddly enough, Mark Asanovich would have his NFL players try and add one pound to their lifts every single week. Now, again, these are genetically gifted individuals. These are the best of the best athletes in the world at this sport. And Mark would be happy if they could add one pound per exercise per week. And his reasoning behind that was the preseason and the regular season and possibly the playoffs is over 20 weeks. So where other teams are gradually getting more and more beat up, more injured, and are getting weaker as the season goes on, Mark's players were getting stronger and their joint health will follow um, muscular strength. Mike Bradley talks about how coaches will have a lot of uh, power lifts and Olympic lifts in their official strength training program, but his athletes, or say not his athletes, but a lot of athletes have confided in Mike that they're not doing them because they know how much it beats them up if they do it. If these athletes have a requirement to be in the gym, you know, 45 to 60 minutes a day or two hours a day during the season, uh, Mike noted in his interview with Jay Vinson that a lot of times these guys are all kind of congregating around the bench press. They'll do their sets on the bench. They'll kind of root each other on. They'll cheer each other on. Um, and after that, they kind of scuttle out of the weight room. They, they kind of dick around in the weight room so that they're hitting the requ required amount of time. But even these athletes know that if they're trying to do these heavy powerlifting and Olympic type lifts in the middle of their season, it's more than their body can recover from. Injuries. Who's to blame? And while this whole presentation is largely my opinion and inference based on the science that I've researched, um, I really want to emphasize that everything on this slide is, is particularly my thoughts. I think trainers and coaches have an ethical obligation to produce the best degree of results in their athletes without compromising safety. That's, in some specific instances, you know, safety has to be a bit compromised. So let me give an example of that. Snatches and clean and jerks are dangerous lifts, but if somebody wants or needs to do them, they should be coached accordingly. You know, if you're an Olympic weightlifter, you have to do these movements. However, if it's not necessary to do a more dangerous movement, there is never a reason to pick a more dangerous movement when a safer one is available. So if a trainer or a coach either forces their athletes or recommends that their athletes do a more dangerous movement um, than a safer one when it's not necessary, I think they're morally culpable in that scenario. If the athlete wants to do it despite being warned otherwise, it's the athlete's fault. Now, as a point of information, the USA Weightlifting Certification for Olympic Weightlifting has 31 teaching points on a power clean. 31. Do we really think that people that are doing power cleans at big box CrossFit gyms or group exercise classes, do we really think that all of these individuals are being correctly taught, supervised, and corrected at these gyms? No. So in my opinion, the trainers have a tremendous ethical responsibility to their clients. And given that an injury like a power clean has the potential to be extremely dangerous, if not performed exactly how it has to be done, given the weight that's used and given how quickly the movement is performed, to me, there is no reason, there is no reason why anybody should be doing these unless they have to perform that movement as part of their sport. So for any coach to recommend this for CrossFit gyms to program in this movement when it's not necessary group exercise classes to have this movement in and not have one trainer for every single person that's doing this movement, 
to me is unethical. And I will die on that hill unless somebody gives me a compelling argument otherwise. A trainer should immediately terminate a set to correct significant form issues and should give verbal instruction to address minor issues. There are some issues that merit immediately terminating the set. I've had to work really hard with one of my clients on the chest press. He is good for most of the reps, but initially, as it started to get hard, sometimes he would try and switch handles very quickly or he would adjust how he was leaning. And I had to work really hard with him and we would terminate the set sometimes. And I would say, you have to sit still. And if you can't sit still, I'm immediately going to stop the movement. I had to correct this behavior because very quickly altering your body position when you're performing a precise movement is dangerous and it should not be done. Now, there are some really minor issues that will happen sometimes that aren't necessarily big deals, but nevertheless merit some correction. So if someone's performing an overhead shoulder press, it's natural that some, you know, maybe five to 10 degrees of either internal or external rotation, depending on where their, the path of their arm is as they're doing that movement, some of that can naturally happen. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And that's something that coaches need to be aware of. And in that instance, you can oftentimes just put your hands on your client's elbows and make sure that they're following a proper path or you can instruct them to try and be more cognizant of that. Um, that's a value judgment that you're going to have to make. But egregious breaches in form should be terminated immediately so the athlete is not at further risk. So when I see a lot of these group exercise classes, CrossFit gyms, I don't mean to poop on CrossFit too much, but um, the trainers really need to get their shit together. Um, and I take massive issue with a lot of things that are done at some of these conventional gyms. And I take massive issues with a lot of things that are done in the name of athletic training with a lot of young individuals. Let's look at some implications of explosive lifting. Let's assume that the hypothesis of lifting quickly and following sport-specific motor pathways, let's, let's say that they give us positive carryover. And let's say that lifting slow makes slower athletes. What logically follows from those two positions? If athletes should lift quickly, well, let's just quickly look at a difference. What's the difference between lifting you know, weights quickly and just performing a normal movement, like hanging up your jacket or maybe putting a grocery on the top shelf of your cabinet. Most movements in sports far more closely resemble normal movements of just daily life than what's being performed in the weight room. So, you know, hanging up your jacket, putting a grocery on the top shelf, um, grabbing a towel, you know, out of, uh, out of your closet if you're going to take a shower that motor pathway drastically more closely resembles anything that you're likely to do in the weight room compared to like a military press. So if training movements in the gym should be ballistic because it's going to produce faster motor recruitment, why are activities that are more closely resemble what the athlete's going to be doing during their actual competition, why shouldn't those be performed ballistically as well? Why are we not teaching that people have to do those things as well? A basketball player who is defending somebody, if, if the offensive player pulls up and starts to shoot, that defensive player needs to immediately close the gap, uh, extend his torso, get his hands up as quickly as possible to try and block that shot. Why are we not teaching that those basketball players, if they're in college, that they need to raise their hands as quick as possible when answering a question in class? Why are we not teaching them that they need to grab a towel out of the uh, closet as fast as possible? Why are we not teaching sprinters that instead of jogging to catch up to a friend or jogging to catch a bus, they should sprint? Why are we not teaching these things? Jogging and sprinting are very, very similar motor pathways, much closer than what somebody's going to be in the gym. If this idea is true, and if there is positive carryover, then we should be teaching these other activities of daily life be performed quickly. We should get up out of bed, get out of the car, stand up off the couch, and get off off the toilet very, very quickly. But no one preaches this. Why aren't we? Why aren't we teaching that more closely related activities need to be performed quickly if strength training has to be performed quickly? Are we trying to condition a pattern attempting maximal motor recruitment? Well, if we're training high intensity training, the last repetition or two is likely to be performed as hard and as fast as possible, right? But interestingly enough, and I'll talk about this a bit on the next slide too, recruitment happens by need. Our body only recruits as many muscle fibers as necessary to perform that exact task in that exact way. This is an in size principle. Oh yeah, there's some evidence to suggest that moving slower 
conditions you to perform slower. This was one speculation that Montoya had. Montoya, in his weighted bat study that I talked about earlier, um, thought that not only was the bat being heavier a different skill, which caused a, velo a loss of velocity speed, but then he also speculated that because it's heavier, you swing it slower. And because you swing it slower, you're conditioning yourself to swing slower in general. Um, but that also doesn't account for the college group that swung a lighter bat and still had lower bat velocity speed with normal bat. So I'm open to ideas here. So someone, please, seriously, send me articles, send me books, uh, send me research papers that talk about this if I've missed any of these studies. I'm open to ideas here. Again, I'm not above correction. I'm not above reproach. I'm not above rebuke. But Otto and Carpinelli's meta-analyses showed no difference with power and explosiveness. Again, their quote, there's no evidence that skill development is aided by the performance of resistance exercises that bear some superficial resemblance to the skills performed on the sports field, page one. Uh, that same meta-analysis, Otto and Carbonelli, I played it you know, maybe 25 minutes ago in this presentation, talked about how um, there's no advantage to lifting explosively or dynamically or ballistically compared to slow, controlled weight. But let's say that lifting slow actually makes you slower. Well, if you're training high-intensity training, you're likely only performing one to maybe 16 total repetitions. One repetition would be like if you're doing a timed static contraction or some kind of uh, feedback statistics. Time static contraction, I've covered it in other videos, but essentially it's, it's one set, one repetition, 90 seconds, it's isometric, you're not moving. First 30 seconds you're pushing with a moderate degree of effort. The next 30 seconds you're pushing relatively hard and old school TSC, the last 30 seconds you were pushing as hard as you could. In a sort of updated version, the last 30 seconds is a little bit different. The uh, second to last 15 seconds, you're pushing about 90% as hard as you can, which is a, a quite hard degree of effort. And then the last 15 seconds is as hard as you dare. And I prefer doing time static contractions that way, but you guys get the idea. Um, relatively hard, almost as hard as you can, all out effort. You're gradually building up to a certain period of time where you have an all out effort. TSC, time static contraction, has a maximal effort and therefore maximal recruitment in the last 30 or so seconds. So could time static contractions be better for athletes? I'm kind of speculating here, maybe. And the reason I think it might be better is twofold. One, in my own N equals one anecdotal experience, but also a lot of people within the high intensity training camp that do TSC have found that um, they find that it digs into your recovery ability less than more dynamic exercise. Um, that's what I've seen and other people have seen it as well, but I, I'm not taking a firm stance on that. The other reason I think time static contraction could potentially be better is by being able to safely exert a true maximal effort. I think you at least have the potential to recruit more muscle fibers than you can if you just reach concentric failure, hold it to isometric failure, and then slowly lower it down. Um, even if you take a set to eccentric failure and you're doing a shoulder press and the machine stops, by the time that that weight is back on the stack, most people let off. But the machine version of like a time static contraction would still mandate that you're trying to push forcibly against that stack, even though it's fully lowered for a certain fixed amount of time, maybe, you know, maybe another 10 to 15 seconds after you've already hit eccentric failure. But could time static contraction be better and could time static contraction cause and condition the body to recruit more muscle fibers than it's typically used to doing? Possibly, but I, I can't take a stand on that. I am just speculating. On the high end, two reps of eight, 16 total repetitions with an explosive concentric and a controlled eccentric. Looking at Henneman's size principle and thinking about skill specificity, well, couldn't slow eccentrics condition slow movement? Why is it that just slow concentrics are seen as possibly bad? If we think about swimmers, sprinters, a lot of athletes need to be fast in full movement patterns, not just half of a movement. A swimmer needs to perform their stroke with as much force as quickly as they can, but then they're only able to perform another stroke as quickly as they can get their arm back into the starting position, even though there's very little resistance in that position. So 
if someone's going to be critical of slow concentrics, I think it stands to reason to an extent, you know, is there some negative skill transfer by having slow eccentrics? I don't know. I'm just posing a question. But bigger picture, I'm not concerned anywhere from 1 to 16 reps in a movement that you're doing in the gym, even if it is mimicking sports-specific activity. I'm not, gonna sure that's, I'm not sure that's going to derail hundreds, if not thousands, of specific repetitions that you're going to be regularly performing as part of your sports-specific practice, as long as that training isn't performed too close to competition and without further practice. So what I mean by that is... I tend to think strength training should be performed as far away from the actual day of competition as possible so you're fully recovered and fully prepared for that athletic endeavor. Mark Asanovich that I talked about earlier, his football players would play on Sunday. They would do their weight training on Monday. So even if there was a negative skill transfer that happened from doing their high-intensity training the way that Mark trained his guys, they still have Tuesday through Thursday and hundreds if not thousands of repetitions in practice to make up that difference of any potential negative skill transfer, which I don't even know if it has a negative skill transfer anyways because the science around skill specificity is it's a little wishy-washy. Um, I have an athlete here in studio, the soccer player. He has his games on Monday nights. He comes in Tuesday afternoons after school for his strength training. I want him as fresh as possible for those games. I don't want him still recovering or still having some degree of muscular fatigue that's going to affect his sports performance. Wrapping things up, there's a lot of conflicting science on how much positive or negative skill carryover there is with the things that you do in the gym to what you do out in the athletic field. The consensus then, the mainstream narrative that not only athletes should lift weights explosively, but should also mimic sports-specific patterns I think comes from tradition. This is kind of the way it's always been done here. Imitation is a big one. A lot of smaller high schools and smaller colleges will look at what more successful colleges are doing, and they will directly copy their strength and conditioning program. This happened when I was in high school football. We followed uh, one of the closer colleges, uh, Concordia. We followed their strength and conditioning program. Smaller you know, D2, D3 colleges will often copy what the D1 coaches are doing. Intuition. There's something that makes sense when we just look at things superficially to say, okay, if I want to perform fast on the on the day of my competition, I need to lift weights fast. It, it makes sense superficially, but I'm not, again, convinced it's substantiated by the body of science. And finally, inference. We all have access to the same studies, and there are studies that support some positive carryover. There are studies that repudiate that. And then there's a Schmidt study in 88 that I pointed out earlier that showed both positive and negative skill transfer. So it's important to try and step outside of our own biases. And nobody is completely above some degree of dunning crew. Um, so again, I am welcome to correction on this. But in my opinion, strength training should be performed as safely as possible to improve strength, improve joint composition. It is unethical to compromise safety unless it's necessary, and any negative skill transfer from lifting will be quickly overwritten by practicing sport-specific movements as part of an athlete's normal routine. An athlete's greatest ability is their availability, which in short means if you get hurt, you can't play. And for a lot of people, professional athletes, if you can't play, that hits your wallet. You know That could affect your ability to sign your next contract. Most sports are tremendously complex open skills. Closed skills have very little, if any, positive transfer to open skills. And even if, even if lifting quickly has a positive transfer from muscle recruitment, and I don't know that it does, but even if it does, I don't think it's worth the risk. And I don't think that the peak force generation is healthy long-term on a lot of athletes and on a lot of people's joints. I think it's almost always a mistake to try and mimic sports-specific activity with resistance training, and it looks like most of the evidence around this particular subset of the talk is showing that there's no positive carryover. Thank you if you've made it this far. This presentation took well over 100 hours of reading, of watching content. It took me over 12 hours to put this Google Slides presentation together and make sure that I accurately referenced all of the relevant research. I don't like doing this, but given the amount of work that went into this, if you feel inclined, Please like, share, subscribe, comment below. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I will talk to you tomorrow. Not tomorrow. (laughs) I will talk to you guys soon.